Welcome to Commune, a global wellness community and online course platform featuring some of the world's greatest teachers. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, pass down wisdom, and bring the world closer together. This is the Commune Podcast, where each week we explore the ideas and practices that help us live this healthy, connected, and purpose-filled life. You can check out our course platform at onecommune.com, where you will find programs from Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra, Russell Brand, Wim Hof, Brendan Burchard, Adrian Mishler, and many other brilliant personal development and wellness luminaries. Our courses span yoga, meditation, spiritual development, functional medicine, recovery, and social impact. Essentially, everything you need to be holistically well. Just go to onecommune.com. If you are one of the superheroes right now on the front line, a healthcare professional, supply chain worker, delivery person, scientist, biologist, or government worker, I want to thank you for your service. If you could benefit from a meditation course on your phone, in your pocket, please email me at jeffk at onecommune.com, and I would be honored to set up access. I have also started writing a weekly Sunday article called Commusing, where I alternately wax poetic and pathetic around spirituality, philosophy, culture, and family. If for some reason you actually want more of me, you can sign up at onecommune.com, all the way at the bottom. And yes, I suppose if you're desperate, you can follow me on Instagram, at Jeff Krasno. My guest today on the show is Robert O'Neill, co-founder of Haven Co-Living, a cohabitation experiment in Venice, California. Haven provides housing for young adults who share a passion for health and wellness. In a way, it's a modern incarnation of a commune where people share resources and responsibilities. In a city which can lack connectedness, Haven fosters community amongst its residents or members. It's part of a bigger trend where young people are prioritizing community over the accumulation of stuff. Robert has a big vision to offer this kind of alternative living all over LA and beyond. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Robert O'Neill. My name is Jeff Krasno and welcome to Commune. You know, the, the real vision behind Haven was to create a, a place for people um, that are kind of want to dedicate their lives to the health and wellness industry um, to um, kind of gather together and learn and grow. So one of the things that we've kind of noticed over the years is that uh, the typical path that a lot of people take is maybe, you know, you go to high school, you go to college, um, and then you get out of college and you don't really know what you want to do. Um, what health and wellness is one of those places, uh, industries that people are just passionate about from the very beginning. And, but there's, there's really no good track to like meet, meet peers, learn. There's a lot of stuff online. There's a lot of great podcasts like yours, but, um, in-person interactions are, are kind of hard to come by. Um, we, we, uh, built, uh, we built out a house in, in Venice, uh, about a year ago. Um, we, uh, we wanted to create a place that not only created community, but also was a place that was close to work. Um, a lot of, uh, gyms and yoga studios and meditation centers are on the West side of LA and, uh, it's, it's it can be pretty unaffordable. So, um, you know, in addition to creating a great community, it's, it's centrally located for people to, um, get to work, um, meet new people build their own businesses, build relationships, um, and, uh, and grow from there. Um, so we think we successfully have done that. Um, we, uh, we, we're opening our second location now in Venice and, uh, uh working on a few more throughout LA. Mm. Interesting. Sort of a, the real world meets a yoga studio in some ways. Um, and I'm dating myself with that reference. Um, and yeah, no, I find that fascinating. Um, I mean, I, I have a company called Commune, um, which is obviously inspired in some ways around the notion of cohabitation, 
uh, around like-minded people with shared resources, um, shared responsibility. So I, I'm curious, like, how does the actual co-living play out? Um, what are, where do people live? What are the facilities like? Where do people eat? Can you give me, like, paint a little verbal um, picture of the experience of living in Haven? Yeah, we, so we um, we took over four um, houses, single family homes right next to each other. Um, and we were kind of trying to figure out what the best layout for building community would be. Uh, for the last couple hundred years, we've kind of spent, um, we've, you know, Americans have been prosperous. We've been uh, be able to afford our, you know, houses in the suburbs with lawns and, and fences and everything. And it's been great. Like, you can't uh, argue with uh, how uh, how beneficial life has become over the last hundred years. But you have to also kind of realize that, you know, we've lost some things along the way. Um, that's why we get a lot of, we've had a lot of depression and a lot of different kind of uh uh, different kind of things that have popped up in society that maybe weren't uh, present in, in, in the world of our ancestors. So, you know, how do we, you know, build community back in? And really it's, it's sharing space, um, having to interact with people, having to have, you know, good, good confrontation, bad confrontations. You know, when, when people are on, on the phone or they're on Twitter or Instagram or one of those things, you know, a lot of this stuff is, it's, you know, you're walled off a little bit from actually having to, um, you know, make decisions based on, you know, well, I have to live with this person for the next year or six months. So, you know, it really challenges you. And so that's the fun part about it is, you know, we, we created a place that you have to share all of your space. So the kitchens, instead of like kind of like looking at an apartment where there's maybe 15 kitchens, we have uh, one kitchen that, you know, 10 people, 12 people share at a time. And so, you know, you have to, you have to like navigate how you're going to cook, how you're going to clean, how you're going to be together. Um, we, you know, you share your bedroom with, with other people, you share the living room with other people. Um, and so all the space is shared within the house. Um, but there's a lot of space too. There's a co-working space. There's a yoga space studio. Uh, there's a gym. Um, there's a, um, a theater room. And uh, a lot of people use the theater room for recording things like this um, and other kind of projects they're working on. So there, um, there's a lot of space to, uh, to utilize throughout the property, but there's also, um, you also have to know that you're sharing it with the community. Yeah, um, because everybody needs access to all the resources at the community. Got it. So, do people, and not to get too uh, in the weeds exactly on the on the experience, but I'm wondering, do people have a very, I suppose, small, modest, contained private space? It essentially, is one bedroom is one's bedroom one zone, or is it really just everything is shared and accessible by anybody? Yeah. So within the bedrooms, um, you do share bedrooms with people, but you have um, much of kind of like you've seen on the in uh, East Asia, uh, Japanese style sleeping pods. So you have like a three walled side area um, hmm. that you can kind of close off and, and kind of uh, uh, close off from from everybody. But we're really encouraging you to be out within the community. So, you know, it's the, the sleeping pods are really for sleeping and then everything else is to to be out and, and growing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I remember, um, one of my initial, um, inspirations for starting commune and we are a digital media platform, but we also have a physical location up in Topanga where, you know, a whole variety of people live and we make honey and soap and media product and, um, and we hold immersive retreats here. Um, but I, I was flying over Southern California, I think from New York, and, and coming in to LAX, and I was looking down at this sort of endless checkerboard of swimming pools. And, mm -hmm. and this was, you know, four or five years ago, so we were really in a proper drought at that juncture. 
And I was thinking about sort of the use of the swimming pool and obviously incredibly wasteful from a water perspective, given the context of, of that time with the drought. But, but more than that, kind of from a utilitarian perspective of like, like how often is a swimming pool even used by a family, you know, yep. once every few days, maybe, yep. and, 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 and just kind of an average size swimming pool, like how many people could that pool actually satisfy? And I was kind of trying to do some rough <laughs> math in my head, you know, uh, allocating square footage for people or something. And, you know, yeah, like 25, 30 people could easily be in that pool having a great time. And then that's when I kind of landed on it. It was like, it's not only less wasteful, it's not only more utilitarian, it's also way more fun and much less work to have shared resources, a shared gym, a shared theater, a shared yoga facility. Um, so it seems to check so many different boxes. And um, I don't know if you've kind of seen like heat maps of mega mansions, you know, um, <laughs> where, where that, that sort of show where people spend their time and they spend their time kind of in the, in their bedrooms, obviously sleeping, but then most of the other time is spent clustered in and around the kitchen and the eating area. And in fact, most of the rooms are not utilized at all. And because they're not utilized, they're not utilized. You know, there, there's almost like a kind of reinforcing vicious cycle there. Um, as you were visioning this project, this experiment, I mean, what were your primary uh, inspirations? Was it kind of environmental, social, you know, solving for kind of like, I don't know what I would say, the excesses of materialism or individual materialism of mega mansions kind of with picket fences around them, separating yourself from other people. I'm just curious where the germination of the idea came from yeah so you know uh i think and you're you're totally right about the swimming pool thing and that's a lot something that we've thought a lot about when we started up it's like okay well you know even something as small as the blender in your house it gets used 20 minutes in a day and right. then it goes up it goes up into your cupboard and it doesn't see the light of day again until the next you know morning where you're probably going to use it for 20 minutes and you know, from from us, when we were first started thinking about like what what are we what are we providing? What are we you know what's what's gonna what kind of um, different things do we need to buy for the house? Like, you know, buying like three or four great Vitamix blenders. Those things get used, you know, 10, 15 times a day. You know, and it's like usually one person will buy a Vitamix. It'll sit there and it'll be used, uh, you know, less than an hour a week. You know, and uh, it's right now we have 96 members. People are in, people are out. And when 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 people uh, think that it, when people come to the house at first, people are like, oh, wow, that seems like a lot of people. But when you walk in, you're like, oh, you know, not everybody's using the space at the same time. So it's it always feels calm and it always feels, you know, just uh, a, a place of kind of serenity. My last company before uh, this one was, an, you know, uh, a tech company. And one of my co-founders came from a tech company. We both had offices at WeWork and we, you know, but it was a lot of people we were working with were remote, but we never had interactions with people that weren't, uh, you know, over the phone or, um, you know, online somehow or through email. And we just felt like we were missing something in our own lives and we were like, you know, how can we create something that we can get the things that we loved in our life, which was experiences from travel, experiences from from college, experiences that, you know, really mandates that you have people around you that, you know, spontaneous interactions can actually happen. So that, that was the kind of germination for it. And then uh, really, uh, I had kind of gone through this phase of, you know, I was in front of a computer all day. I wasn't being healthy within my own life. It's, uh, you know, and community and health were two things that 
I felt like I was missing and I could see it in a lot of my friends, even though, you know, they may not have, you know, they may not be in the place to um, live in community. Uh, it was it was something that I felt like was desperately kind of missing within society. And and that was something that we were like, hey, can we create this? Can we create a community of people, you know, not some place that you're going to live the rest of your life, but, you know, you're moving to L.A., you're you're in a in a period of time that you need um, a healthy uh, mindful community around you to kind of get you to the next place to from where you're where you're at now. I hadn't thought about it as much as this kind of um, transitionary place. Um, where, you know, potentially for young people that haven't like accumulated a lot of stuff, um, which is a whole other topic that I want to talk to you about around the accumulation of stuff. But for young people, maybe just out of college or in their early professional life, as you say, you know, maybe trying to make it as a yoga teacher or within the realm of, of health and wellness, um, that this is a, this is an affordable place to land, but that, but that provides tremendous resources, both, um, uh, you know, from, a, from, like you say, Vitamixes, but also um, community resources. And so do you find that the um, majority of your community or your tenants, I don't know if you call them tenants, but um, are kind of in the, in their 20s, um, you, you know, kind of younger yeah, a lot of our a lot of our members we, we call them members because um, mm -hmm. we're all you know part, sure. we're all members of a community, and uh, so we um, we find that uh, a lot of our pe a lot of our members are people either that are kind of new to LA they want to break into the kind of health and wellness maybe they they're they're here because there's um, somebody they follow that they're, they're really inspired by that they want to kind of go train with or or learn from. Um, and they're really starting out in the industry. So, um, they don't, they're, they're kind of figuring out how they can, you know, um, find their own voice, um, and also learn as much as they can. Um, and I think that's, um, that's one of the cool things just being in, in Venice is there's just, it's kind of like the, the center of a lot of, um, kind of new ideas in the health and wellness industry. So they get kind of surrounded by that. And there's people who, who live and work in the industry already. So, you know, in terms of, um, you know, just finding jobs, meeting people, it's, it's, a, it's an easy transition, uh, into kind of like lifestyle in, in California, especially if you're not, if you've never been here before. And, and a lot of people, one of the things we do is, um, we try to encourage our members to teach classes to other uh, members. Um, and we've had a number of uh, members that, have just finished yoga teacher training um, somewhere, and they taught their first class at Haven because uh, you know they're comfortable with people around them, and and you know it's it's kind of it can be scary the first few times that you you kind of teach to a class, but um, and so uh, we we we'll, we want them to kind of like share their gifts with everybody else, and uh, a number of people have kind of just come from uh, their their the the place they got certified and, and, and are teaching at Haven now. Yeah. It, it's interesting because there's been a, I suppose this elixir between spirituality or spiritual well-being be and co-living um, that goes back, you know, generations. You know, you look back to the 60s and 70s when there was a fringe group of people that started exploring Eastern religions, meditation, yoga, um, you know, and the purpose of those practices is essentially kind of self-transcendence, kind of a, a feeling of unity consciousness or Christ consciousness or Brahman or, you know, very, a lot of different terms to, um, to describe it, but kind of that central metaphor of being a wave in a bigger ocean. And you know, from that kind of spiritual or psychological place, a lot of these experiments in, uh, in shared living or communes were established in the 60s and 70s. Um, 
and uh, and that was a pretty fragile revolution. Um, not a lot of those experiments actually worked out in the end for a whole variety of reasons. So I wonder um, if you looked at any um, models for this and tried to learn from any of the failings. Um, and, and I suppose it all goes back to kind of human interaction and, you know, will people be accountable? Will people take on their fair share of the responsibilities? And I guess you could even take that down farther of like, who always cleans the kitchen and who <laughs> leaves it dirty or whatever. But I, I wonder if you, what, what the reality is that you're finding? Do you feel that people kind of live up to their responsibilities, I suppose? I think, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things I've found super interesting is the power of uh, the community. Um, you know, if you do have somebody who's a, a bad actor in a small way, um, there's not a lot. Um, you know, the community kind of self uh, uh, defends itself mm -hmm. of like, you know, these are these are our standards that we've, uh, we've developed. And if somebody's, you know, um, you know, being messy or not doing something that they they should be doing, uh, you know, it's the communities for the most for ninety percent of the time will will stand up for itself and say, you know, this is this isn't the way that and you know maybe um, some some kind of way of of, uh, of some language that somebody uses or some just something that is maybe off of what the community wants. Mm -hmm. the, there there is a groundswell um, that people will be like. We know what our values are. We know what we stand for as a community and what we want to, what the place we, what the kind of place we want to live. And um, the people that maybe it's not right for um, generally kind of self kind of uh, exit because <laughs> right. yeah. it's not, it, it, you know, they, it's not the, it's not the place for them, which is fine, you know, like, and, and that's what we really encourage when people come in. It's, it's definitely, as I said, it's, we've, we've lived this way for, for hundreds of thousands of years before for thousands of years sorry before you know the last hundred years so this isn't new as as for the human race but it's but it's new for kind of uh you know millennials because sure. they they haven't grown up that way at all and so um you know when you're when you're when you go, come into a community like this we were like listen try it out you know stay you know stay for a month don't make any commitments to it if it's right for you, stay stay as long as you want. Stay as long as you feel like you're val you're getting value out of the community, and you feel like you can give back to the community. And however long that is, that could be three months, six months, nine months, a year. However, however long you think it takes for you to you know feel like you've given everything you can, and at that point is is going to come someday. You're going to feel like I have nothing else to give here, and I feel like I've received as much as I can from the community. And then, you know, we try to support people on kind of their next steps of wherever that is. Um, and so we really try to give people uh, an opportunity to come in with an open mind and say, like, it's OK if this isn't right for you, hmm. because, you know, it's not right for everybody. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's also interesting what you say about essentially that the community sort of self-regulates and that there, because it's a certain size, I think you said 96, um, that there is an accountability. I was reading um, Rousseau, not that I do that a tremendous amount. I don't want to sound like too of feet to the audience here, but I was reading a little bit of Rousseau. And he essentially makes claim that democracy, really where it's most effective, is in small groups. Um, and that that can... And essentially instill a certain kind of accountability where you start to get, you know, societies of hundreds of millions of people, you know, people don't really feel accountable to each other. So I thought that was kind of an interesting point um, that you make. The scarcity now is relationships. The scarcity now is mm. is um, you know fi finding a best friend. You know you know getting getting uh, 
out of maybe some lonely state that you you may have been in. Um, and I'm sure you've seen the studies amongst millennials that you know uh, lonely. It's the loneliest generation in in that we've ever had. And you know it's it, it, they're the most connected generation that we've ever had. But you know there's a sense of loneliness amongst everybody. Yeah. And um, you know and I, and you know I don't know what the ultimate cure for that is. Uh, or, you know, if, if, you know, how people end up wanting to, you know, do that. And I think this whole COVID crisis, you know, it's one of these places that, you know, you want to be together. You want to help people out. You want to help your neighbor, but you're told to be six feet apart from each other. Yeah. So we're, we've never been in this place in society either. And, um, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to navigate. And I think it's a lot to, uh, um, kind of think about where it, where, where it all goes. And I, I personally don't know. Yeah. Well, I think you're potentially inadvertently solving the issue because for me, what, what seems to be the emergent story here is one of localization that we need to upturn systems and structures that have been highly globalized, uh, and that have given birth to what you call the loneliest generation, where if you're a millennial, you're more likely engaged in a passionate exchange over email or text or TikTok or Instagram with someone halfway around the globe than than you than is the poss than you even know your neighbor's name, mm -hmm. and it, it sounds like Haven sort of solves for that, you know, because. You can't help on some level to know your neighbor's name. You're having real interactions instead of, you know, what I think of as private interactions happening in public. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things I thought was interesting was that I was like, do, do, uh, you know, people, you know, 21, 22, 23, somebody maybe right out of college, uh, are, are they self, are, are people self-aware that they're on their phones all the time and they, they don't want that? Or is it kind of, uh, they're, they're just kind of gravitating because they, they think living in community is fun. And, and it's funny, a lot of people, when they come in, they're like, I, you know, I'm, I like the fact that, you know, nobody has their phones on them right now. Nobody's like staring at their phones. Everybody's, you know, playing music or they're having a conversation or they're, you know, writing um, or reading. Yeah, you know? I was, was going to ask you about that. Are there sort of some self or, or some hierarchical guidelines that you either impose or suggest, like, for example, if you're eating at the community table, that's like a no phone zone, or is again, that just sort of like self-regulated amongst the community? Um, we, we haven't put any, uh, guidelines in, um, uh, regarding kind of like, you know, how much time you have to socialize or you don't have to socialize or, you know, and I think everybody, uh, kind of gets into it, uh, on their own pace. The only, the only interesting thing that, um, we that was a kind of a community action that I wasn't really expecting was that we didn't have we we definitely have a no uh, drug policy on the property or anywhere near the property but we allowed alcohol because you know uh, we felt like you know everybody's an adult everybody you know can make their own choices of what they feel like is is fine and early on in, in the community, they said, you know, we're a health and wellness community. Um, there are some people who like to drink and that's totally fine. You can go, you can go anywhere in Venice, you can go anywhere to have a drink and, and do what you want. But when you're here, uh, it's, it's a place of kind of like being around people and it's a place to uh, kind of have, you know, like thoughtful experiences. So, they asked, they came to us and said, Hey, can you make this a rule of just, you know, no alcohol on the property? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, the community voted and we, we put that, we, uh, put that in and, you know, it's not that it's always, it's going to always be there. You know, I think it's, it, but that's, that's kind of something I thought was pretty interesting that they came to me and said, Hey, listen, like, you know, let's, let's just make this a, a rule for the community. That is fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and certainly, yeah, younger generations are, are, are less, I think, inclined to drink. And there's probably also some more options um, for relaxation. And, of course, marijuana is legal now. When I was a kid, it was always like sneaking behind the dumpster kind of mentality. <laughs> um, 
So I suppose there's other options, but I think that that is uh, yeah fascinating. And, you know, there's this kind of whole sober, curious movement, even, you know, people that aren't in, um, in, um, in recovery, it, it's not about actually, you know, a, a problem with addiction. It's actually a, a proactive choice that, um, the people, the younger people seem to be less inclined to yeah. socialize around alcohol or use alcohol as a social lubricant, I suppose. Curious what you see, um, from a gender breakdown perspective, if, you know, men or women seem to be more likely to take a chance on this kind of co-living? Um, right now, our community, uh, in terms of uh, uh, space, we have, uh, it's 50-50 in terms of available space. Um, but our demand is um, about, I would say, 65% women, um, which, uh, you know, I, I, we didn't really know before we came in. Um, but, uh, you know, largely the demand of, of, uh, the people that, uh, want to move into Haven and, um, uh, women actually tend to stay longer at the, at the house. Hmm. Um, so our second house that we're opening is going to be, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, more female heavy in terms of space. Got um, it. yeah. And is there a little bit of a love Island <laughs> component to, to, um, to Haven, I mean, do you see relationships, romant romantic relationships, forming? <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we've been open uh, just over a year. We've already had our first marriage, wow. um, and uh, we've uh, the number one reason for people to move out is they found a uh, a partner, and they're moving in together. Wow. Um, so I, I thought it, you know, I found it to be pretty cool that we've we've. Uh, you know, generated so many kind of like really close relationships amongst people that, um, you know, they've fallen in love. Um, so that's, that's been great. It's one of the, the cool things about it. Um, and, and not just intimate relationships, but also kind of people have, uh, started businesses together. They've, um, kind of, uh, started, you know, playing music together. So there's, there's kind of like a bunch of, uh, if it's a cauldron and, and there's kind of like just, you know, different sparks of, 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 uh, kind of things coming out of it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the plans that you have. Cause I, I think that you're opening another, um, unit or that's not the right word, um, house in Venice. And I believe there's another one planned maybe in West Hollywood or Culver city. So give me like a little bit of the lay of the land on the vision and, and do you expe expect to expand outside of Los Angeles? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, our uh, our original idea was that we would, you know, have, you know, a community that you can go kind of anywhere and like, hey, I'm in New York now and, and you can just move into a haven. I think what we found is that, um, you know, there's just a lot of need in Los Angeles um, just for housing in general and flexibility. Um, you know, you can't really... If you if you've just moved from uh, Europe or you've moved from anywhere across the U.S., um, then you know if you want to move to L.A., it's it's not it's it's hard in a in a lot of different ways. One is obviously finding a place um, that's not you know an Airbnb can be pretty price prohibitive after a certain amount of time for a few nights or a week. Uh, it it kind of works and then it kind of breaks down and then your only other decision after that is a is a year lease maybe you can get a six month lease but there's nothing kind of in between that of like hey i want to dip my toes in the water i want to i want to find a place to live for a month or a couple months and you know if if la works out i find i find great relationships i find a, a great uh experience there and i want to stay here you know um i can continue to do that um and we we we, we have uh, we've had, we have had a, a lot more demand than we've had space. So we've kind of like, are really just looking to, uh, build out, um, a presence in LA as much as possible, just because, you know, we already have a great community here. I think, uh, the community kind of builds additional great communities because, you know, we can kind of, we already have the, the, the seedling of, of people who understand the, the values and mission. So, you know, we're in, like in our new place, we're encouraging anybody who wants to move from our original location here to kind of set the 
you know, set the, the baseline of, of new people who are moving in and what to expect. Um, so we hope to have uh, uh, five or six locations in LA uh, open um, by the end of the year, which would be kind of, uh, you know, the west side of LA, as well as uh, West Hollywood and Silver Lake. And we're negotiating three properties now. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. There's obviously massive uh, housing shortages um, in Los Angeles. And I don't think Los Angeles is alone in that regard, but certainly there's a lot of need to address um, right here. And of course, you know, for health and wellness, it's pretty much the capital uh, of the world. Um, how has it been during COVID? I mean, obviously, shelter in place it is quite different in a co-living experiment versus, um, you know, in your own home. So I'm curious uh, as uh, around what that experience has looked like. Well, I think it's been pretty hard on a lot of our members um, because of a lot of our members are, are, you know, focused on the kind of fitness and, and wellness industry. So that got, that's been hit pretty hard um, yeah. from the beginning. And we early on and, and when it first happened and said, hey, listen, anybody who wants to move out um, are just kind of uncomfortable living in community. We get it. Uh, we'd love to have you back when you're uh, when you feel comfortable. But we ended up just saying, hey, if, if you want to move on, out, we'll refund your money for any any uh, any time that you're, you're you you for whenever you want to leave. And then, you know, just come back when you're ready. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we. Um... My wife owns three yoga studios, all of which are closed. Um, obviously, Wanderlust Hollywood, where that facility I built over in Hollywood has closed. Um, and, uh, and, you know, all of those facilities have 20, 30, 40 teachers associated with them. Um, we are facility up here in Topanga where we host retreats. We were booked every weekend for three or four months. That's course all of those are canceled so yeah the the impact on teachers um in the wellness space has been you know real and uh, obviously you've seen a kind of efflorescence of online activity um but that's tricky because you know there's just so much uh competition and i think you know what you've pointed out i think early on is that the wellness space it's a very attractive and exciting space, but it is very fractured in a lot of ways. It's, um, and, um, and I think that's why what you're providing is so important for community and alliances to kind of naturally build. Um, but, you know, as a, as a kind of sole proprietor teacher, um, trying to make their way, stay close to the work, but also make a living, it's, um, it's very difficult, very demanding. And, uh, you know, particularly in this time. So hopefully, you know, the, the community that you're providing provides some uh, salve for people right now. I'm sure it does. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Robert O'Neill. If you are interested in learning more, check out havencoliving.com. And please feel free always to email me directly at jeffk at onecommune.com. I read every email. That's it from the commune for this week. My name is Jeff Krasno, and I am here for you. Mm-hmm.